Hello and welcome. Well, you'd be hard pressed to find a child that doesn't love sugar and chocolate. Now, besides the fact that it tastes great, and of course it gives us a great pick me up, in most instances, we give it to children as a reward. Of course, when they're good or during celebrations with things like birthday parties, Halloween, Easter, whatever. So really, it's by no fault of their own that children can become confused when we take it away from them. Now, as parents and carers, there's a lot that we need to understand about what sugar is really doing to our children's teeth. Now, to help talk to us about this today, we welcome our special guest, Tabitha Akret, dental hygienist at Airflow Dental Spa. Now, it's a little bit about our guest. Tabitha has 22 years experience in the dental industry and she has a passion for community dentistry and preventative care. Now she has a Bachelor of Oral Health and has since worked in a private practice as a dental educator at Sydney University. And uh, we're just really excited to be chatting with her. So thank you for joining us, Tabitha. How are you doing? Thank you so much for having me. And I'm really excited to be able to talk about something I'm quite passionate about teeth and sugar. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. And I guess it's really time for us to, to rethink next time that we grab a chocolate bar or even just like a, a juice box or a packet of potato chips for our kids as there's hidden sugars in almost everything that we eat, isn't there? I'd love to know your thoughts. Yeah, there is. And it's a real minefield for parents. And I'm a mum and I know how hard it is when you're at the supermarket and you're tired and you've got to get groceries and they're asking for 20 million things and the advertising is in your face and you know you, a lot of things say they're healthy or no added sugar but they can be real minefields to try and navigate because when we read the back and actually learn how to read labels some of the foods that appear to be maybe healthier options can actually have the most sugar in them yes. so it's really difficult because you might pick something and think and I know this is a trap I fell into a lot when I first became a mum was I just pick up anything that said organic because it's yes. like, it's organic, it must be healthy. <laughs> and it's not always the case. Yes, they might have organic products in it, but the sugar may be exceptionally high mm -hmm. and much higher than some of the other products. So by having a look at the back of labels, especially looking at what the sugar content per 100 grams is, is a really good way to start navigating that as a parent. And I just try to read the back of labels. And then once you start to learn, all right, this brand's better than this and this, you don't have to keep reading. You can kind of go to your usuals. Yeah. But looking at that back, especially when you think about something like yogurt, my son the other day wanted a brand of yogurt because it had a, a character on it. And obviously the marketing- That's where they really catch her. So the advertising for kids, yep. <laughs> so I picked it up and I had a look. Now the yogurt that he normally gets is 6.6 .6 grams of sugar per 100 grams. The yogurt that he wanted to get was 18.9. Did you say 18, now, one eight? Yeah, one eight. So 18.9 grams of wow. sugar per, per 100 grams. grams. So that's more than double. It's almost triple. Well, yeah, it's almost triple what that sugar content was. And so when you think about that, like small choices by just looking at the brand of yogurt that we're having can make a huge difference. Some of the yogurts actually have more sugar than a yogo. That's and crazy. Then, <laughs> Yeah, and same as dental cereal, not dental, like breakfast cereal. Some of the breakfast cereals that you look at actually have more sugar than a Krispy Kreme donut. Now, not many parents would serve up a Krispy Kreme donut every morning for breakfast. They'd be like, no, I'm not going to do that. But what they don't realize is, is that with some of the breakfast cereals that they're serving you're up, you're pretty much doing the same. Donuts. Yeah, you're doing the same. Yeah. And, and, and you're and doing it thinking you're doing the right thing. And that's just the thing is that sometimes you think that you, you, you're having the health of your choice, but in actual fact, you're not because of the, the sugar content. And I really, it's in, incredible how increasingly prevalent that, that children are ex experiencing tooth decay um, due to this and the hidden sugars in everyday items as well. Now, I understand um, in, in my preparation for our chat today um, that there's research that suggests that um, Australian children between the age to five, five to 10 years of age are already experiencing symptoms of tooth decay as a, as a result of this. Um, and it's not only does sugar, of course, impact the overall health, it increases both uh, decay and gum disease also. So I'd just love to know initially what your thoughts are on that. It's a really sad situation, actually, because uh, dental decay is one of the leading chronic diseases in the world. Wow. And it's the number one oral health complication worldwide. And the big thing is it's actually preventable. And so that's why as dental professionals, we're really passionate about talking about reducing our sugar and our, the importance of home care. 
because we want to stop your children from experiencing these things. And a lot of people kind of think it's just their baby teeth. But if we don't set up the habits while they have their baby teeth, then they don't just snap in when they get their adult teeth. <laughs> and also if they lose baby teeth before they're meant to, we can then have issues with teeth moving into positions that they shouldn't or issues with speech or function during that time because we don't lose all our baby teeth while we're quite young. It can be up to 13 while we're still losing some of them. Yeah. So if you lose it's not going to come out until you're 12, 11 and you lose it at four or five. That's a long time not having those teeth in place. And the pain and the discomfort is something every parent wants their child to avoid. You know, you don't want them to be feeling the, the pain from having dental decay or, you know, like as much as I live at the dental surgery through my work life and I love treating people, I know in preventative care, it, it's not that terrible, but having a feeling isn't that fun. We know this and you don't want your children to have to get needles or have fillings as their first dental experience. We really want their first dental experience to be a fun experience where it's preventative dentistry and not treatment. Yes, totally agree with that. Now, we published your article and the title is Top Tips for Reducing Sugar in Your Child's Lunchbox. Now, for someone who hasn't read the article yet, can you please tell us what it's about and, of course, what inspired you to write it? It's about making changes and just swapping foods and it can make a huge difference. One of the big issues with children who are going to school with really sugar-heavy lunchboxes is they get highs and then they get crashes. Yep. So besides the dental health implications, there's implications in their ability to learn and to concentrate and to behave at school. And we're asking a lot of these little bodies to sit and concentrate for really long times. And then we want to hype them up on sugar and crash them and, and expect excellent behavior at the same time. So one, to help our children with their education and how they actually can cope at school. And also, if we're giving them a lot of sugar, they get that taste for it and that craving for it, and they want lots of sugar. Yep. So to help maintain that as well. And then so they lead healthier lives because obviously sugar is linked to obesity, uh, obesity, other um, chronic diseases, risks of diabetes, and then we've got dental health as well. So we're looking after their whole body. And children sleep better when they don't have too much sugar as well. So therefore, there's that whole of if you're sleeping better, you're going to concentrate more. So I really felt when I would go grocery shopping with my child that just horrified at some of the sugar contents of foods when I started to really learn about it. And even myself as a dental professional, I wasn't as aware until I had kids and started really looking into it. Mm -hmm. And I think um, the article is just trying to show that there are things that you can make the, the swap, like the yogurt. You know, looking at the back of the yogurts, you can have quite a low sugar yogurt. Now, for me, I always aim to have under 10 grams of sugar per 100 grams as a rule. Even better if you can get it under five, but 10 would be kind of my limit of where I would be going to. So mm -hmm. when I'm looking at that yogurt, instead of that 18.2 grams of sugar, I can make that six grams of sugar. That's a huge difference to the overall amount of sugar that my child's having through the day. Um, custards and pre-packaged foods like that again can be really high in sugar and you can make chia puddings at home that are cheaper and we can pre-make and store in the fridge and have a lot less sugar for our children as well yeah. um, looking at the types of breads that we give our kids some of them are really high in sugar and having a look at you know swapping that over to more multi-grain breads less sugar or swapping to sushi or something like that for our children like there's lots of swaps that we can do to make the lunchbox fun because the kids should go to school and be like, I want to eat this. And also it's hard for parents in the morning. I know how hard it is getting everyone ready. So if we can think in advance and think about things that can be easy and to grab out of the fridge, but still reduction in sugar as well, we need to keep all of that in mind. I don't expect everyone to have a master chef morning <laughs> where they're cooking. Because <laughs> it would never happen in my house either. I am used <laughs> smelling and going, where are your shoes? So <laughs> I know how hard that morning can be. You want to make it as easy as possible, but trying not to then grab for the junk foods when we're doing it, because a lot of the pre-packaged foods are higher in sugar. Definitely. So if, in your view, why is it important like now more than ever to reestablish, I guess, a regular checkup with your dental professional uh, and your dentist um, for children, especially, but for, uh, for adults as well? Is that, is this because there are so many hidden sugars in our, in our, day-to-day -day foods, even things like tomato sauce and all of these things as well. It's just incredible, the hidden sugars. So is this the reason why we need to have checkups? 
Yeah, it's a it's multiple reasons. Um, we can actually catch decay when it starts quite early. It starts in phases. So the first stage will be where the calcium is being drawn out of the tooth and we call this decalcification or demineralization of the tooth. Now, this will start with like a white lesion, then it'll become a brown lesion, then it will become soft, then it will become a hole. But before it becomes a hole, we can actually reverse it. And that's a really exciting, awesome thing. Now, we can reverse that through improving your oral hygiene, decreasing your sugar intake, and then applying products that are either high in calcium or fluoride to the tooth to help remineralize and strengthen that surface. And so if you're going regularly to your dental practice to see your dental hygienist or your dentist or your oral health therapist, they can detect things really early. And the earlier we detect, the less expensive it is for the patient, for the person, which is a win-win, but even bigger, the less invasive it is. Because whenever you get a filling, it's not for life. It needs replacing. So each time it gets replaced, it'll get a little bit bigger, or a little bit more expensive. So if we can avoid getting the filling, we can keep the price down and we can be minimally invasive in your approach to dentistry, which really is the aim. And then also that bacteria in your mouth, you may have a different type of bacteria. The host response, how the person responds, will really change their susceptibility to decay or to gum disease. And that can be detected early. And by having preventative care, by removing the bacteria in your mouth, we can reduce those risk factors. Mm. So what are some, I guess, helpful hacks that you can share with us for getting kids to care for their teeth then? Yeah, look, I know that can be really hard as well. <laughs> Just because I work in dental doesn't mean I haven't had a child fighting with me in the bathroom about not wanting to brush their teeth at night. Um, I think you need to have discussions with the kids on why we brush their teeth. Mm. Um, so I talk to my son about, well, if we don't brush our teeth, they can get sick. Now, they need to be age appropriate. So for him, it's just been our teeth can get sick and sad and they can hurt. So we've got to brush them to keep them clean. And, you know, that conversation can get more complex as they get older. But one of the biggest things is starting the habits early. So as soon as your child has a tooth, brushing it with a toothbrush, with no toothpaste as a baby, but just brushing it, brushing the teeth together as a family. So they see, we all do this. Everybody brushes. You know, it's a normal step. I like that. Habit causing. So if you do it every morning and every night, they just expect it. Routine really helps keep habits. And if we start these habits as a small child, they're more likely to do it as teenagers and as young adults and continue these good habits going on into the future. Mm. And I think you can make it fun as well. So you can have egg timers, you can play their favourite song, you know, especially for little kids, there's YouTube clips, um, you know, Peppa Pig goes to the dentist or Elmo goes to the dentist. You can play things like that. You can do reward charts. Um, electric toothbrushes come playing music now and, you know, you can brush for as long as... Do they really? There are so many different ways. There's apps on phones, like whatever kind of, it's about as a parent realizing what kind of motivates you and motivates your child. And then you can tailor that motivation. You can get these great little tablets from the chemist or your local dental practice called disclosing tablets. And you chew them up and it stains where all the bacteria is in your mouth and it teaches you where to brush. I remember them as kids. They've been around for a while though, haven't they? Yeah, and as a small kid, when your teeth turn purple, as bad as it is, because it means there's decay, every, decay, like bacteria everywhere, it's exciting because they're like, I want to brush it off. This is heaps of fun. So, so you would find those at the chemist, would you? you get them at, at the chemist or at your dental practice can sell some for you to take home as well. And they really love it. My son was always saying, can we disclose tonight? And I'm like, oh, I've been working all day. <laughs> <laughs> so what are they called? What are the tablets called, Tabitha? They're called, they're called plaque disclosing tablets. Plaque and you can disclosing tablets. Cool. Yeah. Get them online. You can get them at the chemist or at your dental practice. And they're a really fun way to learn how to brush properly and do a good job. How often should, should parents and kids be using them then, do you think? I would say what is a really, we kind of do it once a week on a weekend. Don't do it before school. Don't put that pressure on yourself. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> We do it as like on a, on a weekend when we're not in a rush and it really just starts to teach. And what you'll see is each week they're starting to get less and less colour and they're actually getting better with their brushing. But most children don't have the manual dexterity to brush properly until the, about the age of eight. So while you can use the disclosing with them at a younger age, they'll still probably need some parental intervention to help them with it. Mm -hmm. And are there any other particular products that we should be using as well or not? Yeah, so 
when you are small children, it's a bit difficult, but for definitely for adults and teenagers, cleaning in between your teeth every day is really, really important because it's those spaces in between where food and bacteria really catch. And that's the most common place for decay of the tooth where holes to start, where you can't see it and where your toothbrush doesn't reach. So there's awesome product called interdental brushes. Lots of different brands make them. You can get them at the supermarket, at your dental practice, at the chemist. What's it's good to kind of go to the dental practice and they help you select the size because the size does matter. And you don't want to be shoving in something too big or if something's too small, it's not going to collect as much bacteria, but it's a toothbrush for in between your teeth. And you can just go in in between each tooth and clean and remove that bacteria. And we definitely see in clinical practice, people that use these every day have less gum disease, they have less decay, and they have much healthier mouths, less bad breath. Um, Which is always a good thing, especially wearing masks. There's nothing worse than wearing a mask when you (laughs) Yeah, so we've been quite busy after COVID. I'm wondering if it's people wearing masks in there. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, do you have any other tips? Oh, sorry, keep going, keep going, sorry. (laughs) So obviously under, under two years old, children should just use water. Between two and six, they should use a fluoride-reduced toothpaste that's age-appropriate for them. And then after six, when we know they can spit properly, then they can start using just an adult fluoride toothpaste. And fluoride, we know, helps minimise the risk of decay and strengthen our teeth. And this has been something that we've known through research and that we've seen as a public health measure in oral health for many, many years. So using that fluoride toothpaste can make a huge difference. So under the age of two, no toothpaste at all? No, just just water on the toothbrush because they can't spit and they're just going to lick it off more than doing anything. And I mean, do you have any tips for, um, to help parents with children who I guess are really adverse to brushing their teeth and just don't like brushing their teeth at all? You mentioned earlier on, you know, brushing as a family, that there's apps, but is there anything else as well? I just for wanted to clarify. children who are sensory sensitive, um, this can definitely be an issue. So looking at different toothpaste, sometimes mint is a really strong flavour and that can be one of the adverse reasons why children don't want to brush because it actually is a burning sensation for them. Now, most of the children's toothpastes are low mint or different flavours, but say you've got a six, seven-year-old, there are brands that make non-mint toothpaste and you can have a look into that at the chemist or the supermarket because that's sometimes, especially for um, children who are sensitive to tastes and to touch this can be a real issue with them with, and then desensitizing them with the toothbrush. So children that are very sensitive to the toothbrush feeling and a lot of pregnant mothers experience this as well, like gagging during pregnancy, trying to brush. It's about trying to do some desensitization exercises with them. So having them hold the toothbrush and rubbing their tongue or rubbing bits of their mouth when it's not brushing, but just trying to get used to it because that can be a real issue for children that have those um, sensitivities. Yeah. And then, for children who it's just because they want to be them, <laughs> it's about trying to make it as fun as possible and rewards. I'm, I'm all for bribery with children. <laughs> yeah. I mean, how, how would you best describe to a child then uh, for them to brush their teeth? I mean, speaking to a child. So what tips do you have that can maybe help so, some, some parents? For little ones, like really little, you just say, we're going to tickle our teeth like mum. You know, when oh, they're I like one turn it into a giggle like we're gonna tickle 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 you know and you just make that really fun when they're big enough to actually have a conversation with then we can start talking about needing to clean the germs in our mouth and we don't want our gums and our teeth to get sick when they get a little bit bigger again we can start talking about that those germs actually make holes in our teeth and then we need to get something done and so you know we need to get band-aids put on at the dentist and we want to avoid that because we want our teeth to be strong And so having those discussions about wanting things to be strong and healthy and prevent that disease, children actually take that on quite well. My child was actually having a tantrum the other night because he didn't want to brush his teeth. He was really tired. And I was getting really annoyed because it was going forever. And I said, fine, we're not going to brush tonight then. And then he just burst into tears. And I said, what's wrong now? And he goes, do you not understand if I don't brush my teeth? I'm going to get a hole and then I'll need a filling. Do you not even know how this works? <laughs> and, you know, after in my head, I thought, thank you for mansplaining dentistry to me. <laughs> but it's worked. The years of talking about why we brush, he understands. And while he wanted to have that little Mexican face off with me in the bathroom, he really did want to brush them. 
So, I mean, that, that is, that is brilliant now, but like how long should children brush their teeth for every day as well? I mean, so when you were, you know, you're speaking to your, your son, although the, he, he understands the reason why, I mean, ha, how have you described um, to your son and or should parents describe the length um, age appropriate, of course, but that they should be sort of brushing. With a baby, I think getting it in there and touching the teeth is a win. <laughs> And you're not going to try and do it for too long. But when they can actually start to brush for longer, two minutes is really what we're aiming for. And that's what you'll move up to. So obviously a one-year-old, that's going to be really difficult. Um, but one of the great things going back to those plaque disclosing tablets that we were talking about is that they really, you brush until the colour's gone. So you don't even have to talk about time. It's just the colour is bacteria. We brush until the bacteria is gone. And that really helps teach them how long that takes. And then also seeing that brushing just like that and then running away um, will actually not achieve that much and we need to do it. And, you know, it, it gets, I remember my brother being 13 and spending half an hour faking tooth brushing when he could have just done it. So I know how hard it is and you've got to go through all those arguments with it. And, and that's why the disclosing is really good because I often say to parents, don't tell your kids when you're going to disclose, spring it on them. So just come in and go, how did you brush? And they're like, I did excellent, excellent. Now I'm just going to stain the bacteria. Because you actually don't want them to brush really well and then check. You want them to do their normal day brush and then show them, one, you're either doing fantastic or two, you're actually missing a lot and we need to make some changes. So it can be really beneficial to spring that on them. <laughs> I love that. So they, they would have already brushed their teeth, already said, I've done a great job. I want a star yeah. on my, my, my chart today. Uh, and then, then you disclose and then they, yeah, and, then you disclose, the, and then they realize how badly potentially that they, in, in the bit where that they've missed. I think, I mean, the, the way that we brush our teeth, I, I think also is more of a pattern, isn't it? In the sense that we probably brush the same areas more so than others, even as adults. I don't know. Do we? Yeah, we do. And what a lot of people do, because I use disclosing in the dental practice as well. So whenever someone comes in, I disclose the mouth and we have a look at how things are going. Mm. And what 99.9% .9 of all adults do is they're brushing one side, they turn over and one tooth gets missed on the top and one tooth gets missed on the bottom. Because when they do the changeover, it just gets missed. And so we can then teach them to overlap that area or how to do it. But Nearly every single person does that. And even when I disclose my teeth at home, sometimes I think, oh, all right, you know, because it's really easy in the mornings to be thinking about, I've got to get the kids to school on time. I have to do this at work today. This is what I need to get from the grocery store. This is what I need to cook yes, for dinner. Your mind's elsewhere. Yeah. Your mind's elsewhere and you can turn off. So that's what's really good about the truth serum of disclosing solution. It will show you where, where it is. And then, We've got the other issue for people in Victoria at the moment where you're in this lockdown. Oh, which, which issue? How, how long have we got? Because we, we've got a yeah. long list of issues. <laughs> so. Well, you may not be rushing out to the office, unfortunately, but I know that oh, this We're rushing out anywhere because we can't. I wasn't following my normal routine when I was in lockdown because you got out of a whack of doing things and then all of a sudden I'm like, it's one o'clock, I'm still in my pyjamas and I haven't brushed my teeth. <laughs> because you don't have that regular get dressed, we're leaving the house, this is what we do and that routine. So it's important for people who are maybe having their routine thrown out at the moment to still think about, I need to brush my teeth every morning, I need to brush my teeth every night. Because yep. it's really hard being in lockdown and keeping some of those routines are really, really important. And talking about sort of bad routines and bad habits as well, a lot of children love to chew on their toothbrush as opposed to brushing as well. Do you have any tips with that in particular that could help? It's actually a really good teething method for small children because it massages the gums. So I would, when they're really small, then you just say to them, you can have one for chewing and one for brushing. <laughs> and this one is just for brushing because when they're hurting and they're teething, they can sit in like, you know, if you put them in their high chair or something like that, you don't want them walking around the house with it and getting bacteria all over it and dropping it back in their mouth. But they can sit in a high chair or sit somewhere and chew on it. And it's a great way to deliver um, gels that actually help with teething as well. When you put it on the toothbrush, you can then massage it into the gums rather than it slipping off your finger and just numbing up their throat. Yeah. Um, <laughs> a much easier way to deliver it as well. And how often should we be changing our toothbrushes over also? I just wanted to ask. Really good question. Every three months is um, what we, what's recommended. Now, what's really important is, is that the toothbrushes live somewhere where they can dry out. 
So if they're perpetually wet, then more bacteria can cultivate on the toothbrush and then we're putting it in our mouth. If you get sick, so if you get a cold sore or you get the flu or you get unfortunately COVID, you should replace your toothbrush. That's really important because that bacteria can stay on the mouth. Mm -hmm. Now, if somebody in the house is sick, Make sure your toothbrushes are socially distanced as well. Don't have them in the same cup touching each other. That's really important. And if you're in a bathroom where the actual toilet is next to where you keep your toothbrushes. Oh, yes. This is something that make I'm... Make sure the toilet seat is down before flushing. Now, this is particularly important all the time because we don't want that bacteria in our toothbrush. But they actually know that COVID is still coming out of the body even after a negative test up to 30 days through um, going to the bathroom. And if you're then flushing and putting that through the air as well, you're increasing the risk of spreading that if someone in the house um, became COVID positive. So it is really important that not only are we social distancing ourselves while we're sick, but our toothbrushes as well. Yeah. And or just maybe just put them in the cupboard or, or a drawer as well, as opposed to just having them out on the um I know the bench, whatever you call it yeah. as well. I, this is something I, I've always been, but I'm a bit of a germaphobe. So, um, you know, um, yes, having a toothbrush as far away uh, possible from the, from the toilet, I think is, is just a good thing in general practice. Yeah, you know? new <laughs> it's all squashed into one. That's great yeah. when it's separate, but yeah. And making sure that you do replace it. If the bristles are becoming flat, that means you're brushing too hard. We don't actually need to apply a lot of pressure to brush. So if you're getting flat bristles, you could actually be dam damaging your gums and you should replace the toothbrush. And now some tips to deal with heavy handed brushing. Electric toothbrushes are fantastic for that. And some of the models actually have um, modes where it will stop if you apply too much pressure. So it like stalls and says too much pressure to teach you. And if you're going to use a manual toothbrush and you're really heavy handed, brushing in your fingertips because you can still get really good manual dexterity, but you can't get the whole shoulder into it and like scrub. It'll actually make you not be able to apply the same amount of force so that you can turn your brain off, think about dinner and not be scrubbing your gums away. Fantastic. Now getting back to food then, um, and I guess the hidden sugars in food, um, in your article, you list some, um, I guess, top supermarket snacks um, that parents should be avoiding. So I just wanted to ask if you could maybe just go through some of those with us now. So we talked about the yogurts and we talked about the custard. The fruit cups are a big one. Fruit cups are not nutritious. They are sugar bowls with some fake fruit in the middle. So they have more sugar most of the time than having a Coca-Cola. That's crazy. So swapping that to a chia pudding or something like that that you can make at home, you can buy them pre-made, but you can make them at home really cheaply. Muffins are another one and banana breads. They're not bread and they're not muffins, they're cake. They're just cake wrapped up in a different way. Now, treats, I st I'm not saying never give your child a treat, but you just need to recognise what a treat is. So if they're taking a muffin every day or a banana bread every day, they're actually eating cake every day. And so swapping that, um, my son loves to take a boiled egg to school. I just pre-peel it, wrap it in some Glad Wrap, chuck it in his lunchbox. It's really filling. It's nutritious. We've got zero sugar, high in protein. Protein, and really yeah. Um, and then, and it's also getting through our minds that our kids don't have to have a treat in their lunchbox every day, that they can eat healthy and they will eat healthy. Even the picky eaters when we kind of, there's ways that we can get around it and pick different foods, cut it in different ways to help them. And chips, I know for me as a kid, when I look back at my child lunchbox, it was actually horrific. <laughs> but swapping chips for some air popped popcorn. That's a great fun snack. And it's a lot healthier and it doesn't have the sugar or the saturated fats in it as well. Um, and then we don't need juice or cordial in our lunchboxes. Water is really the only drink they should be going with because when we're sipping on juices or cordials throughout the day, we're constantly attacking our teeth with that sugar and the acids. So if we're going to have a drink that we're going to sip on through the day, it needs to be water. If you're going to have a juice or a soft drink as a treat for a special occasion, then we drink it at one time with that meal and that reduces the risk. But we don't want to be sipping on something like that through the day because otherwise we're just constantly attacking our teeth and they can't fight off all that sugar. So what is sugar really doing to our children's teeth then? 
So it attacks the teeth. So it actually, like I said, the first process will be the calcium coming out, the acids and the bacteria attack that tooth and they actually start to soften that surface and cause a hole. And that's when you will get pain or sensitivity or worst case scenario, that decay can go into the middle of the tooth and infect it. And we can actually get an infection at the bottom of the tooth that then needs what we call root canal therapy or an extraction. And so we really want to avoid those things. And, you know, the aim is, is that we would really like most of our children where possible to not get any fillings and make it to their adulthood filling free. And we can do that with regular oral hygiene at home. So brushing our teeth, using a fluoride toothpaste, having regular checkups at the dentist and avoiding sugary foods. So like I said, I don't want to say I'm not terrible and my kids never have birthday cake or never have a treat. I'm just wary of what a treat is. And how often you have that treat because they don't need to be every day. Yeah. And so, so, what are some sorry, of the sorry. more common signs then of um, and symptoms of tooth decay? And I mean, at this case, in this case, I mean, why would it occur, and how should we then manage, I guess, decay in the so tooth? They could have brown spots. They could start getting um, a bad breath. They could get pain. They could start, you know, for the kids that are nonverbal, they could be pulling at their face or hitting it. Um, or more upset or more uncomfortable. Uh, they could, if they can speak, then they can say, you know, it's hurting, could be throbbing if it's quite a bad infection. And besides going regularly so that we can prevent that early, you know, going to the dentist as soon as you see any changes in your child's mouth like that so it can be treated. Because one of the biggest reasons children are hospitalised in Australia is through um, dental issues and having a lot of decay and needing to have treatment under general anaesthetic. Really? And really serious problem and that's something we'd really like Australia-wide to see reduced. If children end up with chronic and um, long-term decay where lots of the teeth are decayed, they can actually get infections that if left untreated could turn into blood poisoning and they have become septic and can end up in hospital and we see this every week in Australia. So it is a really serious problem Mm -hmm. when things are left unchecked and one of the biggest causes of the problems when we see it like that are children that are going to bed with a bottle of juice or a bottle of milk and sleeping with that bottle because that sugars stay on the teeth all night and they're constantly being attacked. So we really would love to see a reduction in those cases. And, you know, our biggest aim is to see children to be caries free. Mm -hmm. So beyond making healthy choices um, in the supermarket and, and making the swap, as you were saying earlier, uh, making that conscious decision of, of, of just understanding initially reading those labels to understand, okay, that's got X amount of sugars. That's over 10 grams per hundred grams, as you were saying. So once you establish, you've made, made, made that swap, what else can parents do to help establish a routine um, when visiting, I guess, the dentist for professional cleans and or just checkups is there anything else that they can be doing going early is really important um if the later we leave it the more intimidating it can be for children so starting really early let the children when they're too young to get in the chair let them just come with you and just watch and and start to get comfortable about the dental practice for children who um are fearful or potentially on the spectrum, you can make visit books and the dental practice can send you some photos that they take so that you can send set up books at home so they know what to expect when they come in. And some of the first visits that we do with small children is just a ride in the chair. We just let them go up and down in the chair. They come to a visit with mum or dad, just talk to them about, this is fun. It's like a ride. Let them, we might count their teeth if they let them, but we really try to make it a non-confrontational fun experience so that they really see it as somewhere fun to go and we can start with preventative dentistry. And then doing the home care, using the fluoride toothpaste, drinking water as our main drink. Juice, it has as much sugar as soft drink. It's just, it's it's soft drink wrapped up in a misleading label. (laughs) That's what juice is. And so avoiding it and avoiding other, you know, the sugary foods and brushing our teeth at home. Now we've spoken about um, tooth decay, but I wanted to also ask about just plaque um, as well, but how difficult is, is it for for plaque to be removed without professional help as well? Is it possible? Yes. So plaque is soft and you can remove that at home with your toothbrush. Now, obviously the older it gets, the more stubborn it is to get off. 
When plaque has been left there for 24, 48 hours, it can start to calcify through the calcium in our saliva. And that's when you can't get that off with your toothbrush. That's when you need professional intervention to remove that so that we can remove it. When that hard um, plaque, the calcified plaque, which we call calculus, or lots of plaque, which we call biofilm, is stuck to the tooth, can actually cause inflammation of the soft tissue, so the gums that support our teeth. Now, that might manifest as bleeding, um, sensitivity, red and puffy, bad breath, you might start to notice in really severe cases that teeth are starting to get loose because it actually starts to affect the bone and that just starts to disintegrate around the teeth. And that's why when you hear people getting long in the tooth or loose teeth, it's actually from that gum disease. And this is a really serious condition, which we know has links with controlling diabetes, um, cardiovascular disease, Alzheimer's, and the list is really long. And it it affects your systemic health when you have that much bacteria in your mouth. So seeking treatment for that is really important, but the biggest thing is preventing it and having those preventative care appointments at your dental practice so that you can have that bacteria removed from your mouth regularly, the bits that you can't get to or the bits that you've been missing. You can get that oral hygiene instructions and motivation, which is really, really important. And that can really help you with preventing those disease processes because once we start getting um, disease of our gums and the bone around our teeth, while we can make it stable, we're then always at a high risk for the rest of our life for that reoccurring. Yeah. And I wanted to ask you, what is airflow? Um, we mentioned it at the start of the chat and um, why should children and parents be using the treatment? So airflow is the game changer in dentistry, really. I've been using it for seven years and it's really changed the way that I treat patients. So when you've normally come to the dentist, you might expect to get a cup that's got paste on it and they polish your teeth at the end, mm -hmm. where we use technology that is air, powder and water, and it washes the teeth really gently along the gums and removes all the bacteria and gets into areas where the cup and the paste normally can't get to. Now, if you've got that calcified bacteria, then you don't need to use the instrument that removes that as much either. And it's a really gentle way of removing it keeping all the tissues in your mouth intact because it's the least invasive way to do it. But it doesn't hurt. The water's heated to 40 degrees and that's what lots of people, they're like, oh, I don't want to go to the dentist because it's cold and I have sensitive teeth and it's uncomfortable. And it often, with kids, they say to me, it tickles. So it's a really non-invasive, gentle way to have your teeth um, with the bacteria removed. And it's really changing that way of making it not something you have to be fearful of, but I don't want to say enjoyable because maybe people don't like run in wanting it, but they, they, they don't. My patients do like it. Like the other day, a patient said to me, that is the nicest clean I've ever had because there was no pain. It's comfortable and it's a lot quicker as well. Nice. So you can find airflow practices by going on the airflow dental spa website and you can put in the suburb that you're in and it will show you where practices are that use that. So there's general dentists, your orthodontist might use it, or if you have problems with your gums, your specialist might use it. But there's many practices around Australia and the world using this technology so that we can be minimally invasive and provide the best care to our patient possibly. Fantastic. And look, we've covered off a lot of information today. If you were to summarise your key messages for anyone watching and listening, what would they be? Home care is the most important thing that you can do. So brushing your teeth, cleaning in between your teeth, visit your dental practice regularly. Preventative care is way better than treatment and reduce your sugar. Mm -hmm. The only thing we didn't touch on was flossing. That's the only other thing, I guess. So I kind of avoided it because it's quite technique sensitive. So those little brushes that I was talking about, that replaces flossing. And I actually think that that's a much better technique and a lot easier to use and you'll remove more bacteria and the science behind it actually shows that you're going to keep your teeth and your gums healthier with them compared to floss. So the brushes are definitely what we promote at my workplace and I work in a specialist centre where we treat people with gum disease and it's definitely what I promoted in preventative dentistry as well. Yeah, this has been fantastic. And I've actually learned quite a lot today. <laughs> but if anyone's got any other questions for you and or want to learn more about Airflow, um, whereabouts can they find you guys? So we've got the Airflow Dental Spa, um, .com .au. You can go on the website. There's lots of information about Airflow, how it works for patients, and you can find clinics that can treat you.
Right, Tabitha, I've had heaps of fun today. I wouldn't have thought that I would have had so much fun learning about teeth, but I actually have. So thank you. And I hope everyone watching and listening has as well. Um, and definitely there's been tons of information that's going to help. And as I said, learn heaps. So thank you. And in the meantime, stay safe and um, hope to maybe have another chat again in the not too distant future. But until then, stay safe. Thanks again. Thank you so much for having me. Bye, everyone. All right, take care. Bye.